Good afternoon to everybody. I would like to thank this August Chamber for the invitation that they have extended for us to speak here and also to the efforts of the Embassy of the Republic of the Philippines in bringing together this, uh, this conference uh, so that we may be able to reach out to the Portuguese people regarding not only the commemorations that are being done in the Philippines, that will be done in the Philippines, but also uh, plans in the future with regards to uh, uh, strengthening Portuguese and Philippine relations. Well, I have been tasked to speak on Magella, and at the time of its arrival in the Philippines, who we were, what we were doing, and for most, uh, for most people, and especially I do remember my, my conference back in Spain last year, at Valladolid, that uh, I was simply surprised also that many Spaniards also were not aware of who we were when, well, at the time of the so-called discovery of the Philippines. And I would like also to add in my paper that it is not only about Magellan's arrival and what he saw that I would be, that I would like to talk about, but also hopefully rethink Magellan's arrival in the country and the rediscovering of the Philippines. On October 12, 1992, and I would like to start off with this particular part in history, you know, in world history, various parts of the world, notably North America, led in the celebration or observance of the Columbus in Centennial. In this marked the 500th anniversary of the so-called Age of Discovery which was set in motion by Christopher Columbus. Uh, his fate, uh, and his fateful voyage in 1492, leading to the discovery of what was to become the new world. He was supposed to have been looking for India in search of spices, but instead was blocked by one big continent called the American, that will later be referred to as the American continent. Columbus's achievement caught the imagination of his contemporaries in Spain and Portugal, in this incipient age of conquest. What is now being referred to as the Age of Discovery was actually a series of explorations beginning in the 15th century of territories outside of Europe. The growth of cosmographical knowledge enabled these aggressive and ambitious men to launch explorations and expeditions to various parts of the vast unknown world across the ocean. And as mentioned earlier, Terra Incognita, or as some maps would, would say, Ixoplaponis. Spain's thrust into the New World extended far beyond the American continent. In 1511, or roughly 90 years after Columbus's landing on the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean, the crown of Portugal laid claim to Malacca, halfway around the globe, with what is now Malaysia, or part of Malaysia. This marked the beginning of European expansion in the region. Described by historian, the historian Martin Wood as the great sprawling center of Asiatic commerce, legendary emporium of multitude of nations, Chinese, Arab, Hindu, Japanese, Chinese, and the island races of the Southeast Archipelago. Malacca was the principal distribution center for cloves, cinnamon, pepper, and nutmeg grown in the Moluccas, Sumatra, and the island of Mindanao in the Philippines. Actually, earlier in 1509, Lisbon dispatched Diego Lopez de Sequeira to survey Malacca on the belief that the Spice Islands were in the vicinity and not in India as previously thought. Another ship captained by a certain Desusa included among its officers Ferdinand Magellan who had been an officer in the Portuguese possessions in India and, Man and Malacca. And together with his friend, Francisco Serrano, went on this particular voyage. The conquest of Malacca was the most spectacular development in this period, for this great anthropod uh, it was the key to the whole Far Eastern trade. Although Ferdinand Magellan would later on serve the King of Spain, he still remained in heart as a Portuguese. He assembled the fleet under his flagship Trinidad and sailed on September 20, 1519 from San Lucas, Spain. On March 17, 1521, 
Magellan is epoch making uh, expedition sighted ground on the island of San Lado in what is now the island of Samar in the Philippines. This event would change the course of history forever in this world, in this part of the world, notably in the country that was to be called Las Islas Filipinas, after the King of Spain, or the future King of Spain at that particular moment. For several generations of Filipinos, their first introduction to Philippine history was that the Philippines was discovered by Ferdinand Magellan, and that the first Catholic Mass, as mentioned earlier, was held on Limasawa, a tiny island south of Leyte. The Magellan story would live on for centuries, and every Philippine history book would invariably begin in 1521 with a discovery. Magellan's portrait or monument would grace public plazas or buildings. In Cebu today, there is a Magellan Hotel as one of its prominent landmarks. Millions of Filipino parents would name their first point Ferdinand. Magellan's predecessor in the Americas, Christopher Columbus, would be honored with the formation of Knights of Columbus, which is an organization that would be founded across that particular country. As he arrived in the Philippines, as would be seen from the maps, okay, after arriving on the flagship in the Victoria, the first thing he would be encountering would be, and using the map of Pedro Murillo Velarde here, uh, from the, um, 1734, um, well, that particular, at that particular moment, the islands that would, he would be seeing would be less than what this is, as we see right now. Okay. Using uh, the maps that would be prepared by Antonio Pigafetta, okay, based on the toponyms of the natives at that particular moment, used to describe the places, he would, dis he would see the islands based on as he arrived in the islands. So this one would be in the southern part of the Philippines, okay, where you have the, uh, the chart made by Pigafetta, that is Cagayan, Sulu, and Panglao, which is now in the island of Mindanao. So when Magellan arrived, this was basically what we saw, the islands that were in the south, okay, and in the middle part of the Philippines, which is now part of the Visayan region. Now, uh, later on, okay, future navigation of the islands would show okay, parts of the island of Paragua, which is now known as Palawan, and the island of Ponyo, okay, which is now part of Malaysia. Now, as you will see here, okay, and this is also part of the discussion in earlier regarding in Magellan's role in the first mass of the Philippines. You will see here the chart of Pigafetta showing the island of Mindanao, wherein it can be seen in the town of Butuan, where supposedly, okay, uh, well, as, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, that the first mass also would be occurring. And then you have the islands of Polo and other smaller islands that would be seen during this particular period. Okay. And then, you will see the islands of Panay, Negros, Cebu, Bohol, Leyte, and Samar, where uh, Magellan sighted the first islands of his when upon arrival in the country, okay, and naming this island from seeing the island of Samar. Okay, of course, that will be his first encounter with the islands. Now, I'm here to talk about what were, who were the Filipinos uh, as described and seen during that particular moment? Now, Filipinos at the time lived not as a nation but according to Balanganic units, which we call the Balangay. And the Balangay, based on um, uh, the, uh, the description of that, part, uh, that time, were actually related to the word Balanghay, which came, which means or the boat, or the large boats that were built were in families are considered part of that particular, particular boat. Okay. So you have the barangay as the community used by the early Filipinos. So as described by, uh, by William Henry Scott in his book, Baranganic Society, 
He says here, when Antonio Pigafetta went ashore to parley with the ruler of Limazawa, they sat together in a boat thrown up on the shore, which Pigafetta called Abalanga. When the Spaniards reached Luzon, they found the word for that also being used for the smallest political unit of Tagalog society. Now, the barangay was headed by a tattoo. Okay. Well, the word tattoo still exists up, uh, up to the present, but, the, uh, but previous to the coming of the Spaniards, okay, the tattoos were the rulers of each barangay. Each barangay was actually composed of 30 families, and in some particular places, there were there were super barangays, or super barangays, which would contain more than 30 families. Now, the barangays were units of government headed by the tattoo. And each unit was independent from the other barangays. Now, in each barangay, there was a social structure. A pre-Hispanic or what we call pre-Magellanic uh, society composed of various social structures in Philippine society. There was the Maharlika, which is the, uh, which is the nobility, the higher nobility. You have the Makinoho, which is the middle nobility, the lesser nobility, and then you have the Alipin, the Alipin or the slaves. Now, uh, these photographs or these particular prints were taken from the book or what we now refer to as the Boxer Codex, which basically contains descriptions of 16th century Filipinos that were seen by the Spaniards during that moment and recorded based on uh, how they were seen, the particular groups that they belonged to, and each in the in each particular description in the Boxer Codex, you will see different kinds and types of Filipinos in their uh, in the way they were dressed and of course in the ornaments that they would be wearing. Now, there was what you might call a civilization before the coming of the Spaniards, and as I mentioned earlier, okay. This social structure would be composed of the nobles, the freemen, and the dependents for the slaves. Now, there was no, what you might call, a general government existing at the time, as I mentioned earlier. The social structure in the Philippines was dependent on each barangay. Now, the barangay would be composed of these people as seen from the, from the boxer codex. And you will see the members of the upper class, and this is Tagalog pre-Hispanic society. And uh, well, what is notable in this particular print is that before the arrival of the Spaniards, gold was already being used for trade and also being used as an ornament. And as you will see here, the members of the upper class were already wearing gold as a major ornament for everyday living. Then on the rightmost, you will see, I'm sorry, you will see the members of the lesser nobility, although not as rich as compared to the Mahardikas in the first structure, you will see that they were free men, although they were not as rich as the first group. And in the middle part, you will see the Alipins or the slaves, and it would be easy to describe them because of what they would be wearing. Now, in general, pre-Hispanic society before the arrival of Magellan was practically almost the same in most part of the archipelago, but also dependent on the indigenous tribes that would be discovered in various parts of the country. Now, one particular aspect of pre-Hispanic society 
would be the existence of a written language. And we refer to this as by Bayin. Okay. An indigenous script widely used in the islands, which still exists even up to the present. Now, as you will see, okay, uh, the so-called index in the script, known as by Bayin, would be uh, based on the syllables, okay? And even up to the present, some indigenous groups in the country are, would still be using this particular form of writing. When the missionaries came, okay, and they established the parochial schools, unfortunately, okay, at, at a later part in our history, the by Bayin would practically use it, would be losing its importance because the Spaniards would later on be Roman, Romanizing the alphabet, okay? And then unfortunately, only a small percent of the population would be able to use the, this so-called by Bayan script. Now, one particular form of the, uh, by, the by Bayan script would be coming from my island province, known as the island of Mindoro. And in the island of Mindoro, even up to now, the indigenous people there, the Mangyans, still uses the, uh, the Baibayin, which they call the Ambahan. Okay? And as you will see, okay, modern day indigenous peoples of my island province would still use the Ambahan as a means of communication and recording. Now, in other parts of the country, especially in the southern part of the Philippines, where, uh, where uh, uh, Magellan would be encountering uh, so-called the natives of the islands, you have here the pintados, pintados because they were tattooed. And these pintados would be the forerunners of the present Visayans in the Philippine islands. Now, as you will see, they will be different from the Tagalogs, you know, from the dialect of Luzon. And uh, uh, although the Visayans could be tattooed, of course, okay, it does not mean that uh, they would be poorer as compared to the, the Tagalogs you know, in the northern part of the islands. Now here you have, you have Visayans wearing uh, long sleeve gowns and also wearing jewelry. Okay. Now, this drives a point that, like what our national hero said before, that before the arrival of the Spaniards, before the arrival of Magellan, okay, there was a civilization already existing in the Philippines. Okay. And this would be shown by the prints from the 16th century. Now, slavery existed before the arrival of, and during the time of Magellan. Okay. But these slaves were actually slaves because of either debt or simply because okay, they were captured from, uh, from raids from the other communities and then made slaves. Now, one particular uh, group of slaves known as the Alipin Sagibilid, well, I'm not saying that they still exist even up to the present, but in a way, when we say alipin sagigilid, meaning slaves coming from the corners of the house, okay, or from the corners of the dwelling, okay? Well, uh, well, in a way, in some parts of the country, they still exist because in terms of the architecture that would be made, uh, that would be introduced during this particular period in terms of the housing, the housing developments, you will see that, well, even until the 18th century, the structure of a Philippine house would be, although it would be wide, the corners of the house would be, would be what you call it, empty. So that any time that the slave or the helper is called upon, then he or she would appear in, from any part of the house. Now, uh, another point also to mention here, as I've shown you already, some of the so-called prints from the Boxer Codex. You also see here 
Okay. The members of the Principalia, as they will be later on be referred to, the Principalia would be actually members of the pre-Magellanic uh, noble houses, although they, will be, they might be losing their powers during the following centuries of Spanish colonial rule, their influence over their areas, over the people in their particular communities, would still be felt and would still be respected by the locals. And that is why, during the Spanish colonial period, they were referred to as the Principalia, meaning the first of their, the first of their class. Now, as you will see here, okay, and I'm referring to people from the Tagalog region, from the north and from the Visayas, you will see that during the first 50, 50 years of, of colonization in the Philippines, when Christianity would be introduced, okay, many pre-Hispanic many pre practices and rituals would also still be maintained. Okay. And as you will see here in the Visayas, Okay. Uh, you will still see here, although they may be already wearing, okay, uh, like there, for example, Christian symbols. Okay, like the stampitas as we refer to them. Well, they still would be maintaining okay, their pre-Hispanic culture and practices okay, during the first 50 years or the first century of colonial rule. So. With regards to beliefs, there was an existing pre-Hispanic or pre-Magellanic, I would say, religious belief already present, which consisted of a pantheon of gods, spirits, creatures, and men that guided the streams, fields, mountains, forests, and houses. Batala, who would be the highest deity in the uh, in, uh, pre-Christian uh, era, okay? would be the one who is believed to have created earth and man and was superior to the other gods and the other spirits. So we, do, we, did, uh, we did have what you might call a religion already existing before the introduction of Christianity. So we, did, we had what we call our supreme god and our so-called lesser beings. Now in many parts of the country, this particular practice still exists. They exist because there is what we might call a syncretic religion, meaning a mixture of Christianity and what we call the pre-Hispanic beliefs that are still being practiced even up to the present. So the presence of anitos or gods, which still would uh, exist, especially in the indigenous communities, that in some places, they could be placed side by side with Christian symbols so that there will be what you might call a fusion of the past and of the present. Okay. Now, these anitos okay, would be made of wood, would be made of stone, and they would be placed in important, part, in important parts of the house. Okay. And Three, uh, the religion of that time would be led by a babaylan. Who was the babaylan? The babaylan was a priestess. Okay? He was, she was the healer, the epic chapter, and the bearer of folk knowledge. Okay? And the babaylan, okay, as you see there, would be the one connecting the local, the local people with, with their gods or with the spirits which were present in the Anitos. Now, a good question that also would be uh, important to ask was that, and this has been asked before, is that where did Philipp was there, like if there was a barangay, how did the pre-Hispanic Filipino live? Okay. And of course we have here, the houses are described by missionaries, as you will see there, uh, houses that would be built on trees, and these and this three houses, could still be seen even in the most remotest part of the Philippine Islands up to the moment. Okay? As you all know, there are more than 7,000 islands in the Philippines. And in the 7, 000, more than 7,000 islands, there are still communities still existing that would still be living 
in what you might call in their pre-Hispanic stage, in the stage before they were discovered. One of the most important traditions that uh, Filipinos would be known for, and this was seen by Magellan himself and described by Pigafetta, would be boat building, the tradition of boat building. Now, as the smallest unit of Philippine society was the barangay, and the barangay would be referred to as the ship. Okay? The barangay would actually be boats that would be able to carry various numbers of families traveling from one island to the other, and because of that, as the barangays became the basic unit of Philippine society, it would be referred to also as the basic political unit of Philippine society. So we have here examples of, pre, uh, of boats built by Filipinos. One would be the Calapoa, which we use as a war boat, uh, uh, not only for transporting families, but also for transporting warriors. Okay? And uh, these warriors would be, be transported to attack another barangay, and then and later on return with the booty and return to their barangays. Now, as mentioned earlier, one of the first, one of the major so-called um, uh, legacies that would be left by Ferdinand Magellan would be the introduction of Christianity. And the first mass in the Philippines would always be remembered as the beginning of Christianity in the Philippines. Okay? Together with that, you will have also here the story of the first baptism okay, in the Philippines, okay, as seen by this painting by one of our famous painters, Fernando Omarzor. And as mentioned also, in seeking to recover true Philippine history, we would need to look more deeply into the pre-colonial milieu. The islands that Magellan supposedly discovered were always there. They had long been there with their own cultures and religions. They were going about in their own peaceful ways and traditions. Magellan simply stumbled upon them and upset the whole native ecology. The tribal people resisted the Western intrusion. Lapu-Lapu, they would defeat Magellan when the latter tried to intervene for a local feud, in a local feud. The people also received wholesale baptism or conversions of Christianity. Mindanao was never effectively controlled during Spanish colonial rule. The Muslim communities already had a sophisticated cultural system. Throughout the archipelago, there would be revolts and rebellions against Spanish colonial rule. They did not always win, but they fought nonetheless. Yet these were really studied and made integral parts of institutionalized Philippine history. Filipinos were subjected to a process called cultural imperialism, in which idealized versions of Magellan and his fellow conquistadores holding the cross on one hand and the sword on the other were happily greeted by natives, who would later be baptized and given Christian names like Santos, de los Reyes, de la Cruz, and so on. However, the Philippines did not fall completely into the orbit of colonization, and Filipinos retained also their indigenous names. Like, for example, up to now, we have surnames that were existing before the period of colonization. Tatlonghari, Punumbayan, Putong, Palpalato, Langi, Dayan, Gamulo, and many more. Historical distortions and myths die very hard, if at all. It is these myths that our textbooks and institutions mindlessly repeat over the ages which have conditioned colonized peoples to accept injustice and also uh, inequality. We do not want to romanticize the natives and demonize our foreign conquerors, as it were. Unfortunately, there is nothing more that can be done to change the past, but we can search, certainly learn from it. In this process of rethinking and reconstructing the way we look at the history of our country, 
before the arrival of President Magellan, this is what gives us real significance that soon we will be observing in, 15, in, in 2021. For us Filipinos, this will be an opportunity also to rediscover ourselves. Thank you very much.